Okay, thank you for the chance to give you all an update on the NHGRI GWAS catalog and some recent developments that we have implemented. Um, we thought we would originally communicate some of these developments to you in a, in a slide in, Eric direct, in Eric's director's report, but then we thought council might be interested in a more detailed report. And before I start my presentation, I would really like to thank Helen Parkinson's group at the European Bioinformatics Institute, or the EBI, who have really done the lion's share of this work, and I think we may have uh, one or two team members joining us on videocast. Okay. So um, by now, uh, most if not all of you are familiar with this view of the GWAS catalog data that shows the different genotype phenotype associations that have been identified from published GWAS studies. We update this type of diagram every quarter. Today I thought I would take you, um, let's see, not to the end of the presentation, I thought I would take you behind the scenes and um, show you a little bit about our curation workflow, as well as describe to you some of the recent developments related to developing an ontology for the GWAS catalog traits, as well as some improvements in our diagram. And then finally, I'd like to give you a preview of our new automated diagram. So to give you a sense of how information flows into and out of the catalog, we have a weekly literature search and we survey the NIH News Clipping Service for eligible studies. We then look at these eligible studies. Our curators pour over every single table, every single page of the paper to identify eligible associations. We have first level curation that extracts um, study level and association level information. We think it's important to do a, a second level check, uh, both for quality and for consistency purposes. So we also implement that level of, of checking. Before we published the data, we had implemented a data flow process with colleagues at NCBI, whereby they provide some additional genomic annotation and some additional rudimentary QC. And then finally, the data are published to the web. So as I showed you before, we also have a manual quarterly diagram, which is done painstakingly by hand by Terry Manolio and Daryl Lea. So every quarter when new associations are added, um, they work together to literally hand place each new dot on that diagram. So as part of our ongoing and future improvements, one thing that we're working on now is developing a framework to more consistently um, and in an expanded way collect standardized ethnicity information on the curation side of things. It's worth noting that everything you see here in red is, is by and large all manual. It's, it's very time intensive. Um, and of course, there are some ways in which we hope that we'll be able to increase our efficiency, efficiency of curation through um, informatics and, and other developments. And of course, our um, collaborators at EBI are, are working on a number of developments related to curation, diagram, and ontology um, features. And the focus of today's talk is the diagram and ontology features. So from a, historical, from a historical perspective, many of you may be interested to know that before the catalog was a database, it was preceded by an Excel spreadsheet, and even before that, a word table. So this is sort of <laughs> why you see um, the word, um, let's see, this isn't working, table. Yeah, okay, thanks, table up here. Um, so we now have a web entry that was developed for us by Kent Clem of the NHGRI web team. This is just the front page that the curators see if they want to start the curation or enter a new study or, or check on the status, status of a published study and so forth. This is just um, a, a brief uh, subset of the data we collect. Everything you see here in blanks is essentially a piece of information that the curator uh, manually enters. Um, maybe cut and paste might save a little time, but it's, it's by and large mostly manually entered. We did, um, with the help of um, our collaborators from EBI, add this new functionality where if the data are in a spreadsheet, they can be uploaded directly into the database, which has um, been helpful in terms of reducing um, errors as well as adding more SNPs per paper in a more um, time-efficient way. We do monitor the most popular searches that are um, performed by our users. So here you see on the left, the most popular terms that were searched for um, in the calendar year to date. And for those of you who are visual, this is a wordle of the same information, where the uh, size of the term is proportional to the number of searches. And you can see here that um, the most common searches are those related to various cancers and, and diabetes, and to a lesser extent, some, of, um, some other um, common diseases. So this is, uh, for those of you that use the catalog, this is a snapshot of our search interface. A user can search in this uh, blank box um, for a particular string that matches a, a trait in the catalog, or you can browse this uh, relatively long list of traits and highlight the ones you're interested in, and then um, that will bring up the relevant results in the catalog. 
So Helen Parkinson, who was an expert in developing and adapting ontologies at the EBI, noticed that, um, of course, this is a relatively unstructured trait list. For example, you can see that a trait such as diabetes is, um, if you look on that long list of traits, is classified both under diabetes as well as the specific type of diabetes, perhaps with um, other traits in combination, um, if that's what the paper reported on. And she saw an opportunity to integrate these traits into an existing ontology and facilitate um, categorization of these traits to enable uh, more systematic and more powerful searches. So the ontology that we're using here is called the Experimental Factor Ontology. It's, it's EFO for short. And it reuses multiple resources to produce a controlled vocabulary of experimental variables, such as those related to an anatomical feature or a particular disease. So the ontology also allows relationships to be specified among the various terms, which generates a hierarchy that can then be used to expand a, a query, such as searching on all immune system disorders. Um, it, it will also allow for combinatorial searches, uh, such as uh, um, that one you see here. Being able to more broadly categorize traits means that we can go from um, about 200 manually defined traits, which is what you'll find on our current GWAS diagram, to on the order of 20 ontology defined traits, um, which of course makes it easier um, to kind of peruse the diagram visually as well as classify these uh, traits. The new ontology can also be used to improve the generation of the GWAS catalog diagram, um, as, as I alluded to. And to date, the following features are available on a new diagram display, which I will preview for you in a moment. Um, first of all, the diagram is now completely automated. Um, every new um, study or result that is added can now be uh, using an algorithm placed on the GWAS diagram. The display, as I'll show you in a moment, is interactive. You can um, zoom in and out and uh, highlight certain traits of interest. Um, we've consolidated traits into higher level categories. This means fewer colors and the ability to sort of discern the distribution of the various uh, trait categories among the different chromosomes or similar similarities and differences among the groups if you're so inclined. Many of you are familiar with the PowerPoint progression that shows the number of GWAS hits that have accumulated throughout the various quarters. We now have that in web form in a dynamic time series display. And then if you have the Chrome or Safari internet browsers, there is the functionality to do interactive filtering on a trait. So let me show you the um, new diagram and the website at which it's hosted. We will also put a snapshot of this on our uh, genome.gov uh, catalog homepage if you're familiar with going to that page. So I just want to say that this is a work in progress and for that reason I'm showing you screenshots. Um, it will continue to be updated uh, with your feedback in response to other, um, other things on our list. So first I'll just um, explain to you that this zoom bar here is um, going to allow you to zoom in and out of the diagram. So if we highlight a particular region here on chromosome 6 and click, you can zoom in and even farther. So you can see the resolution is quite nice. The EBI team put quite a bit of effort into um, choosing the right colors um, that would kind of highlight the differences among the groups. If you hover over a particular trait, you can see here it will bring up a hover over that tells you what that trait is. I should have I should also mention that if you click show legend, it will give you that um, color-coded uh, legend of about 20 traits that I showed you previously. So if you click on one tab to the right, um, this is the time series that I was showing you. On the bottom here, you see that it, the, uh, there are different kind of dots. This is sort of a, a slider that will iterate through di the different quarters. I'm showing you here a snapshot from June 2009 click one tab over and you'll find the filtered diagram. So this is an example of a diagram that is filtered just on diabetes. We have um, 10 filtered diagrams available so far. These correspond to the most popular terms through 2011 and 2012. And the slider on the bottom iterates through these 10 different diagrams. If you click one tab to the right, that shows you um, where you can download pic uh, J, uh, PNG files, which are just image files, of the, the diagrams, the filtered views, and if you're so inclined, the ontology files that underlie uh, the diagram. I don't have time to go into these, but if you click on help and about, there's also some additional documentation, um, including um, where the data come from on the GWAS catalog homepage. So as I alluded to, this is very much a work in progress. Um, what we hope to um, 
work on in the near future includes making interactive links from the dots that you see, saw on the diagram directly to the GWAS catalog data, as well as to other genome browsers that may have additional data in those genomic regions. Improving filtering features is also high on the list, so um, in order to provide an autocomplete, um, w which is where you can type in a few letters and then the system will fill in with, excuse me, fill in with additional traits um, that start with those letters as well as synonyms. We also hope to deliver a filtering based on PubMed ID, as well as combinatorial queries of more than one trait. So because this process is now automated, it means that we hope to provide a more frequent updated diagram. So currently it's quarterly and we foresee going to a monthly and perhaps weekly diagram. Um, also high on the list is improved browser compatibility. So if you are an Internet Explorer or a Firefox user, the interactive filtering is a little bit more limited at the moment, but you can access the filter views. If you have Chrome or Safari, this functionality should be in place. And of course, we'd love to hear your suggestions. So I'd like to thank our GWAS catalog team, in particular um, on the curation side of things, Peggy, Heather, Jackie, and Janella. Um, Kent Clem does our database design. Daryl and Terry have been instrumental in providing the quarterly updates that uh, you all know and love. And then in uh, our, I'd, like, I'd like to thank our colleagues at NCBI for their uh, involvement in our uh, data flow process and providing some additional genomic annotation. And then finally, for this particular talk, um, as I mentioned, most of the work has been done by Helen Parkinson, Tony Burdett, and Danny Welter. They've really done an outstanding job on the um, ontology and diagram improvements, and it's been a very uh, fun and productive collaboration to date. So with that, I am happy to take any questions. Um, uh, yes, I'm just a little, a, a little, I think this is really good, it's valuable. It, it, is it a huge job? It seems, I mean, I know making the, the visuals is, is a lot of work, but it's just something that once it's done, it's an engine, and then you just add to it, and, pe and everybody can use it? That's, that? That, that's the idea behind automating it, yes, is okay. that there's sort of an algorithm. And we, we wanted to make it look as familiar as, as it could because I think people tend to recognize and, and use the quarterly diagrams that we have. So we wanted to make it as close to Daryl's diagram as we could. I mean, there's really no substitute for sort of his, you know, judgment and discernment and, and, and kind of um, visual acuity, but we're trying to get as close as we can. And, and then when you say it's funded by that grant, who is that grant to? I'm, I, I that, misunderstood who did that. I mean, okay. I know all, you, all of you. Yeah. So, so um, just to backtrack, the the grant is is to EBI. Okay. So okay. they're they're um, supplemented to do some of this work. So is that a that's a U award, and so is that um, continuing? It's I can't see that's in the. Um, it's 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 currently funded as a supplement. Oh, okay. That group. Okay. Yes, uh, I think Jill and then Rex. So yeah, I th I think this is really nice, and uh, the the visualization is great. I just. I, I notice as long as they've got this interaction, it, it would be kind of nice to actually get the exact locus of these variants. Yes, okay. You when you roll over, you get the, you know the the what the SNP is associated to, but you don't get its its location. Do you mean like one p thirteen point two? Yeah, okay. yeah, something. Yeah. It's precise. Or, yeah, because okay. they have it. Why what? not? Why not? You know, I roll over. Why not see it? The, so what, one of the things we'd like to do is, or at is least have it as an option. Yeah. So as I alluded to, what, one of the things we're hoping to do is to have that um, hover over, take you directly to the GWAS catalog record, yeah. which does even that better. But we we can include that in the hover over yeah, as well. Yeah. I mean, if it looks like because you're only seeing one label at mm -hmm. once, and so adding it is not. Right. And it's you not going to be visually. Yeah. Bleh. And, and we want to just kind of reinforce that this diagram has data underlying it, and we want to point, take people to the actual yeah. data. So no, that's I think that's a great analyzed. idea, yeah. So yes. Uh, Rex? So now that you've got driven by an ontology, do you have the option of actually driving it by alternative ontologies? So for example, could you go in and use Go function or mm -hmm. Go process? to drive that. I think that would be extremely powerful. That, that's a great question. And actually, EFO uses Go. Um, so I know that ontology can be incorporated easily. Um, because I think we have a, a lot of emphasis on diseases, I think MeSH is another one people mention frequently. So we could explore that as well. But I think Go is already sort of I I incorporated here. Yeah, but it would be really great if you could actually use a Go term 
you know, enter in and go to enter and go to Yes. So, so um, one thing that will be made available is I know that when when they have a chance to incorporate this, they will include all of the synonyms, which I believe includes all of the go terms. Does that so if, if for example the GWAS catalog trait is called coronary heart disease and the go term is something else that may not be the best example it, it will also bring up those synonyms. Yeah, yeah I guess I don't know is, EFO well enough to know how granular it is. I mean, you, you might end up with a lot of duplication there if it's not granular enough. But it, it, all, it's all going in the right direction. Okay, okay, we we take your point. So we should definitely pay attention to go specifically in terms of a way to be able to search on on terms. I mean, we have like the ontology portal. It would be really cool if you could actually pull up any ontology and apply to this. Mm. That would be extremely powerful. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Mike. I'll just second it. This is a really useful tool, and I'm really glad to see it going this way. The automation is great. Is, is anything happening on automation in terms of the original data gathering, or is that still very much a manual process? We are we are exploring ways to make that better. Um, I, th I think we we probably will um, be working on that in the in the near future. Um, it's definitely one of those areas where you know it, it's obvious that there's a need, um, but we ourselves don't have that expertise in house. Yeah. If it if it does stay a manual process and it becomes overwhelming, I'm not sure that it is. But if, if it did become. 10 to the minus fifth is not a very high bar or very low bar, depending on how you're looking exactly, at it. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if it came to, gosh, we really don't feel like we can do justice to this, if you went to 10 to the minus 6, that would not be a terrible mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And in fact, um, you know, I, I think there's always going to have to be some aspect of manual creation. I think the, the data mining can perhaps present eligible associations for us. But I think on just having, having done this for a while, I think we, we do, at least for, for the foreseeable future, want to make sure that, you know, the associations meet our criteria and so forth, which you can't always aut automate. You, you do need a human to make sure that you know the make make sure that the association is in line with your criteria. It's a judgment call. Yeah, and if that is the case, which which I think is mm -hmm. perhaps absolutely right, um, I think it's more important to make sure you get all the significant results, genome-wide significant results from a paper, rather than trying Not to get everything at 10 to the minus fifth. Yeah. Because honestly, yeah, yeah. in this context, 10 to the minus fifth typically is not that interesting, mm -hmm. and 10 to the minus 6th, 5th versus 6th versus 7th, those are, in principle, orders of magnitude. Uh, and no, they won't be quite, because some papers won't even talk about things at 10 to the minus 5th. But, but it could be a significant time savings. Good point. Thanks. Yes, David. You mentioned the most common um, search terms. Mm -hmm. um, do you also have some sense of who the biggest users of the GWAS catalog are? You know what? I probably sh could have pulled that up. We do have the user logs that show the IP addresses, so I, I, we could probably look into that. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, I, I look at it frequently, but I'd be curious how much of the users are researchers versus physicians versus, you know, interesting public with uh, something that they're struggling with, because I think that also influences what types of features might be the most useful to, to build in in the future. Right. If 90% right. of your users are researchers, then the kinds of things that you want to easily link to are get right to the genome position or give me all the encode uh, elements that are in a, re you know, that sort of thing. Whereas if a lot of the users are looking at it for a different reason, um, an emphasis on the graphics, et cetera, uh, is, anyway. But I think you have to know that. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yes, Bob. And then just ask you something quickly. In a conversation I had with somebody at NCBI a little while ago, they told me they couldn't capture the IP addresses and tell me who it was who was uh, looking at material they put up on their website. Is it is that was, was that true or not? I, you know, that's honestly not my area. I, I thought we might be able to, but I I, I could have misspoken. I, I'll need to check on that. Yeah. The issue is whether the government was allowed to capture that kind of information. I, I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. I will look into it, though. Yeah, as I said, some parts of the government But I think they have a judge standing behind them, don't they, Rudy? <laughs> so, 
If we can, I obviously won't be able to look in that up for you. Bob, so. I, it might be a level of precision. I mean, I know I've been given summary information about who's hitting various NHRI websites, so forth. I don't know the level of detail. I mean, we could try to find out. But I mean, so I, I don't know what they what they were saying they, they couldn't find. They said they could tell me if it was in EDU or in org or com or something yeah, like that. Yeah, or maybe what country. Nothing more specific than that. Oh, yeah, I don't, I, may, I, you know, I don't Maybe I misunderstood. Too, no, right? that's probably right. I probably yeah. can't go too specific to tell you what country it's from and things like that. So I don't know the level of resolution we can find out. But, but maybe, you know, if, if we can find out EDU, that would at least point us to, you know, some academic institutions that might give us a, you know, preliminary indication. Uh, I think uh, Tony and then, and then Ross. Um, how, do, how does this hook into, let's say you found a CNV in a gene and you're looking at a browser uh, over that gene. How can you then get access to all the SNPs that have association data back through to, to your, because that's the kind of information you want to get when you get an entry point into a gene. What other associations are there? So the specific example you gave of a CNV, we don't currently track in any comprehensive way in our catalog. Mm -hmm. um, we start with um, SNPs basically, so RS numbers, which you can browse directly or download directly from our catalog. The specific example you gave might be a better fit for another resource called FeeGenie, Phenotype Genotype Integrator. Um, some of us from NHGRI collaborate with NCBI on that, and that is actually a more comprehensive data portal that includes association data from the GWAS catalog and dbGaP linked to other resources such as CNVs, genes, um, and, and um, hopefully in the near future, um, ENCODE and other data as well. Thank you. <laughs> yes, we can certainly we can certainly add that to an, a future council meeting. Be happy to update on that. Yes, Russ. Yeah, the, the, this is really great. And when you uh, uh, showed us these uh, the interactive diagrams, like uh, you handed a, a, a toy to a kid on Christmas, and all of us are <laughs> sitting around here playing with it. And the um, uh, I wanted to. Uh, what I was hearing from people, all kinds of suggestions, and I'd like to maybe generalize it. it see, now that you've got this interactive display, uh, you you've effectively have a really good uh, uh, genome browser for this kind of, of research. And if there was some way to set up a, uh, a query page, so, you know, to query on any field in, in, in your GWAS mm -hmm. catalog, and then display them so we would have control over what p-value we want, uh, what, what terms we want. And, and I think well, <laughs> you, you may, it, it may not be that many more steps. I mean, I think getting this interactive display was really a major one, and, and now is, this display is useful again. So it's great work, and keep it up. Thanks. I will pass on. It, it wasn't my work. It was, it was largely the work of the ABI well, folks. Pass they'll be extremely excited to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>